Welcome to this APUSH lecture on imperialism. This is lecture 19 in the series for this course. I am Dr. King Owen. Let's explore the expansion of the United States in the late 19th century, examine the political conflicts that that caused, and look at the economic motives and the diplomatic results of Americans reaching out into the world. Our prologue today is a story about a young historian. Um, this historian is Frederick Jackson Turner, pictured here with this uh, fine looking mustache. Turner gave a very important um, paper in 1893 which he then sort of coasted on the rest of his entire life as a historian, uh, but he did train a whole generation of people after him. Um, so he's quite significant um, in historical circles. This presentation was on the end of the US frontier. That means the frontier inside the United States where Americans had settled from sea to shining sea and Turner noted that it was closing. In fact, really settlement had closed as of 1890. Most of the US was settled. He also explored the nature of that frontier in this paper, arguing that the frontier is where democracy keeps getting reborn. As people advance across uh, the frontier of the United States going from the coast to the next coast. They recreate the conditions of democracy. He even talked about them recreating the culture of their German forebears, their Anglo-Saxon ancestors, as they're remaking lives for themselves. Uh, Turner, of course, became um, a widely noted historian because of this frontier thesis. But a lot of people ran with his idea and took it in other directions. The idea of America's closing frontier inspires many Americans in the late 19th century to wonder, does the US need to expand beyond its borders? If we've occupied all the land in the US, should we explore beyond that? Can democracy survive inside the United States without the safety valve of the frontier expansion? Turner's ideas are gonna set the stage for the US reaching out into the world. And many of the believers of US expansion, the supporters of this expansion, are going to argue that it is America's right and duty, and in fact need to go out into all of the world. So let's explore how and why they do that, and also how and why that's different from earlier expansion. Many times we could look at America's imperialism in the late 19th century as Manifest Destiny 2.0. Is it? How is Manifest Destiny like but also different from the imperialism of the 1890s. Well, let's think back to Manifest Destiny in the 1840s, 18, up to the 1890s. The idea of Manifest Destiny was a focus on expansion of uh, America's land holdings. Um, the idea was we had a God-given right to take these lands out west. It's driven very much by slavery, since slave owners believe that without new lands for cultivation, slavery will become trapped in the South and then a race war will start. So Southerners are in many ways driving Manifest Destiny in the 1840s. Once those new lands get conquered, they become states. That is, they become part of the United States. And the people who live in those lands 
eventually become citizens once they uh, go through the process of becoming a state. The justification for manifest destiny was, of course, not only is it God given, uh, but it would spread democracy and America's values to these lesser, these backwards, these uncivilized peoples um, on the frontiers. The new manifest destiny of the 1890s is going to sound very similar, but there are some key differences with imperialism. First of all, imperialism's focus is not necessarily on land. The imperialists aren't thinking, I need territory. They need markets, they need resources. So they need raw materials and they need people they can sell things to. The imperialism of the 1890s is not driven by slavery because that has ended thanks to the 13th Amendment, but it's driven by businessmen, men who see markets and opportunities for their businesses overseas. The new territories taken under imperialism would not necessarily become states. A few do, but not all of them. And there's a really serious debate about whether the people in those territories would become citizens. Could they be incorporated into the United States and become part of the American fabric? A lot of imperialism is done through the work of missionaries. Missionaries often go ahead and establish themselves very early on in these places. Um, and they're followed by businessmen and others, and then eventually U.S. control. So that's still pretty similar to uh, Manifest Destiny. By the late 1890s, the rise of a scientific belief um, in the superiority of certain races over others leads to imperialism being influenced by Anglo-Saxonism and the idea that Anglo-Saxon culture was the most superior racial culture that you could have in the world. Um, and it justified not only spreading that culture around the world um, because Anglo-Saxons deserve it, but because then those Anglo-Saxons could teach culture to ignorant and backwards and uncivilized peoples. There's also a military need for imperialism. Um, the US needs naval bases. If the US is going to expand around the world and have access to resources and markets and other places, it's going to need places where ships can stop and refuel. So as you can see, there are some similarities in imperialism to Manifest Destiny, but also some key differences of emphasis. Our last point to remind ourselves is the Monroe Doctrine. Um, this is not necessarily part of imperialism um, because it's been in existence since 1823. It's this idea that America has extended this sort of curtain around the Western Hemisphere, and that curtain keeps Europe and other places out of things that uh, they shouldn't be in, such as the politics and economies of the Caribbean or South America. The Monroe Doctrine by the 1840s gets extended to places like Hawaii. So as the US is kind of extending this curtain around the Western Hemisphere, deciding what belongs under US influence, um, that's gonna become a key development in imperialism that doesn't really apply under Manifest Destiny since Manifest Destiny is sort of all internal. Um, so keep in mind the Monroe Doctrine, and by the time we get to the end of this lecture, you'll see how it is changed and modified. There are many voices for imperialism in the 1890s. I'm going to give you two examples. Um, both of these examples could be useful in an essay. They could be useful in an SAQ as providing specific evidence to support a point. Our first voice, pro-imperialist voice, is Josiah Strong whose book, Our Country, praises Anglo-Saxon culture. Um, he comes at imperialism with a missionary eye, so this is about Christianity and spreading civilization. Our second voice is Alfred T. Mahan, whose influence of sea power on history is going to see imperialism more from a strategic 
point of view. He's going to argue that the most powerful empires on the planet have navies. Navies need bases. So here is Josiah Strong and then Alfred T. Mahan. Another set of voices, of course, that we could quote, um, I've chosen to do it here in the form of an illustration, would be the voices of businessmen. Businessmen who see the world as a vast opportunity for them to sell goods to other people, to sell chemicals, agricultural implements, um, even down to the Duke family selling cigarettes to people in China. America makes many products. And as Americans find out uh, three times during the Gilded Age, the American economy itself is not always stable. So finding new places to sell products becomes a way of surviving when there are economic downturns like the Panic of 1893. You can see here leading exports in 1875 uh, and in 1915. 1875, I mentioned tobacco, like the Duke family. Um, cotton, definitely still a fairly big manufacturer uh, or product manufactured or put together for export. Uh, wheat, so obviously we do export food, meat products. You can see over time, there's a greater emphasis on industrial products, things that are made in factories. So we start seeing automobile parts, engines, iron and steel, machinery, and other metal products by 1915. So the U.S. shifts away from agricultural-based exports more towards industrial exports. One of the key events pushing the United States into an imperial position is a war, the Spanish-American War. This war begins actually as a revolutionary conflict for Cuban independence. Cubans um, are challenging their Spanish uh, controllers, dominators. Um, the United States is watching uh, as this revolution is unfolding in Cuba, and it is being stirred up in the American press by yellow journalists. These are journalists who will exaggerate and sensationalize the story of what's going on in Cuba in order to sell more newspapers. So sensational newspaper coverage of this revolution has Americans riveted to the news, waiting to see the latest and trying to figure out, should America be involved? Should we help the Cubans, those poor Cubans, fighting for freedom? But there are also economic interests in Cuba. The United States has interest in Cuban sugar plantations. In fact, one of the biggest monopolies in the United States during the Gilded Age is a sugar company. Uh, controls 98% of the sugar market. So businessmen have a key interest in what goes on in Cuba. It's not just sympathy for Cubans and it's not just yellow journalism. The United States sends um, the Navy down to watch and make sure that American interests and Americans are protected. Um, the explosion of one of those ships, the Maine, leads the United States to declare war. Um, though we have no evidence to indicate that the Spanish actually blew up the Maine, Americans believe that they did, and sometimes belief becomes reality. Predictably, the U.S. wins this war in four months. And that sets the stage for the United States to become an empire. That is, not just a country that won its independence from an empire, Britain. We are now going to be an empire of our own. Cuba is freed. That is, you can't really take Cuba and make it the next state of the United States since it was fighting for independence. But that doesn't mean Cuba is really free 
because Cuba becomes a protectorate. The United States exerts its will over Cuba and actually orders um, the Cubans to make some very, very um, purposeful and intense changes um, to their constitution that would benefit the United States. As the empire uh, goes, the United States does take other lands, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. The Philippines had also wanted their independence, but the United States believed that they were unfit for self-governance and therefore took them under their control. The Filipinos did launch a rebellion and the United States repressed that rebellion between 1901 and 1903. And to round out the war's uh, sort of cost for the United States, uh, the US paid Spain 20 million for its troubles. Here we have an illustration of yellow journalism. Um, these are the two leading newspaper publishers, uh, Joseph Pulitzer, William Randolph Hearst, um, pushing the war agenda for what was happening in Cuba. And you can see, of course, their yellow outfits are a nod to the yellow journalism. The explosion of the main, the blame for the main, falls mainly on Spain, um, is not really well understood uh, because of the limits, of course, at the time of investigating. The probable cause of what happened was a boiler explosion of some kind. But at the time, most Americans immediately turned against Spain and argued that this is really a problem of Spanish sabotage, Spanish treachery. And with already the heightened concern for war, um, thanks to yellow journalism, Americans found a convenient scapegoat in the Spanish. Not every American agreed with the new imperialistic designs of the United States. The reason that many Americans were uncomfortable with these imperialistic designs can be seen in the case of Hawaii. Hawaii had been taken under the uh, control of the Monroe Doctrine in 1842. Uh, missionaries and uh, planters had settled there. And in 1893, they had decided to overthrow the Hawaiian monarchy. Um, this was a very, very illegal maneuver. Um, it's a coup. And the United States initially was hesitant to accept Hawaii into the United States because could the uh, US accept this new uh, territory when it had been taken under such dubious and not clearly legal means? That's going to set up uh, a really, really important uh, distinction for um, imperialism uh, for lots of Americans. How will these territories be taken into the United States? Coups? Mm, that makes us uncomfortable. Wars? Okay, we're a little bit more comfortable with that. Anti-imperialists took the arguments a lot further by questioning whether or not the United States even needed to have a role in world affairs. 
For example, they argued that the U.S. was not an empire. The U.S. is a republic. Republics, by their definition, do not imperialize other places. They also had racist motivations. If the U.S. incorporated new territories like Hawaii, for example, that might bring backwards and savage peoples into U.S. citizenship. Those savage peoples would then vote, and what would their effect on the politics of the United States be? So many Americans were questioning whether or not the United States should have this imperialistic role, both from a racist point of view and all from a legal constitutional point of view. Part of their concerns were um, allayed in 1901 in the insular cases in which the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution does not necessarily follow the flag. That is, the U.S. may plant its flag in other places around the world without granting those people full citizenship. They can become under U.S. influence without being full citizens. So this helps make the concerns about incorporating these backwards and savage peoples a little less worrisome for some anti-imperialist Americans, such as Mark Twain and Andrew Carnegie. You see here, the United States expansion to um, Asia included not just Hawaii, um, but Midway in 1867, Wake Island in 1899, Guam, thanks to the Spanish-American War, the Philippines, um, America and Samoa. All of these places, of course, could become naval bases for U.S. Uh, to land ships um, through its economic and diplomatic um, priorities. As the United States is expanding, it is looking more towards these markets in China and Japan. So think about all the lucrative opportunities for business people to sell things in Asia. Here we have a picture of the last native ruler of Hawaii, Queen Leolu Kalani, and a cartoon illustrated illustrating the shotgun wedding of Hawaii to the United States under President McKinley, a move that many Americans with anti-imperialist leanings um, criticized, considering that Hawaii's addition to the United States came through a coup. The question of annexing the Philippines also haunted U.S. politics in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War, with President McKinley claiming that he did not sleep until God told him that the Philippines should be a part of the U.S. The cartoonist here on the left um, not only compares McKinley to past dictators, so we've got Julius Caesar and Napoleon Bonaparte, but also employs racist imagery to describe the Filipinos, shown here wearing um, some sort of material that looks like it's made out of jungle uh, foliage, and then drawn to look like contemporary depictions of African Americans. The Filipino who led resistance to the U.S. annexation efforts is shown here on the right, Emilio Aguinaldo, who was fond of quoting America's own history to say that the United States began as a revolution against empire, and it has no business trying to create one against the wishes of the Filipinos. The Philippines were seen as, quote, unquote, the stepping stone to China. And therefore, the United States taking them was not just a matter of civilizing them, as the cartoon here shows, 
with President McKinley about to bathe this squealing Filipino child, but also a matter of markets and lucrative access to Chinese markets would be a lot more sustainable um, with control over the Philippines. Giving the Philippines over to possibly being taken by another European power um, or even independence was just deemed economically unsound by many Americans. After the Spanish-American War, the United States stepped up its interventions around the world, interventions that now look like they go against the, the tendency for America to be roughly isolationist, at least politically and diplomatically, uh, through most of its early history. For example, in 1899, the U.S. Secretary of State John Hay issued the Open Door Notes, saying that the U.S. position in China is that China should be open to all nations for trade. No nation should dominate China. No country should control all the Chinese markets. China should be open to everybody. Not only did the U.S. say that China should be open for trade by everyone, but the U.S. would also use military force to protect missionaries and business people in China. During the Boxer Rebellion in 1901, in which the Boxers or the Society of Harmonious Fist attempted to rid China of Western influence, the United States intervened in that conflict and sent troops to repress that rebellion. So as I like to say to my classes, the US will invade for trade. And that's a theme carried forward by President Teddy Roosevelt, who became president of the United States at the assassination of William McKinley. And he launched his own vigorous, tough man policy of US intervention around the world. A good example would be how Teddy Roosevelt in 1902 used the US Navy to support a rebellion in Panama. Why would you report, support a rebellion in Panama? So that the Panamanians would become independent and then immediately give land to the US to build the Panama Canal. Roosevelt also, two years later, announces an extension of the Monroe Doctrine, an addition to the Monroe Doctrine called the Roosevelt Corollary. So the Monroe Doctrine tells the world, stay out of the Western Hemisphere, the US will manage the Western Hemisphere. Roosevelt subtly changes that. In his extension, he puts a new twist on the Monroe Doctrine to say that the US will preemptively restore order in any country under the Monroe Doctrine to make sure that that country is not misbehaving or as Roosevelt put it, engaged in chronic wrongdoing. So the US would not merely protect the Western Hemisphere, the Caribbean, South America, it would actually invade those countries in order to keep the order, in order to keep an order that was friendly to US economic interests. Teddy Roosevelt talked about these policies in terms of a big stick. He's fond of quoting an African po proverb to walk softly and carry a big stick, to use the threat of violence, the threat of the show of potential force in order to make sure that other people do not imperil your prerogatives as a nation. So the US is starting to grow pretty rapidly by the turn of the 20th century. The United States is getting a little bit big for its britches, according to this cartoon, having started from a tiny little nation that gained its independence by fighting the British Empire, growing through Manifest Destiny, the Spanish-American War, and then finally reaching out into the world. Notice conspicuously the ship under Uncle Sam's 
um, arm here, symbolizing the need for trade and economic power around the world. Also notice the emphasis here on Uncle Sam. So historians have looked at the changing symbols of imperialism and noted that imperialism really emphasizes masculinity. Uh, historian Kristen Hoganson has talked about this in her book on the Spanish-American War, that Uncle Sam really changes the dynamic of imperial control by layering onto it um, a discourse of masculinity. This is about men's power to dominate and control the world. Whereas before, manifest destiny could be represented by a woman. You might recall the 1872 cartoon, American Progress, which showed Manifest Destiny as a woman carrying a book, marching across the continent. No longer can a woman be leading imperialism. It's now got to be a man. Here's a boxer in China um, rejecting Western influence and William McKinley, shown here, going to help take down the boxers in order to protect American missionaries and businessmen in China. This cartoon showing the United States as holding the key to China, the open door, as you can see here, the U.S. has unlocked it. The argument being that the U.S. and the rest of the world benefits with an open system of trade. And this cartoon illustrating the big stick. Teddy Roosevelt here at the center is shown mediating the world's problems by his addition to the, Rose, uh, the Monroe Doctrine, the Roosevelt Corollary. And that means using force to maintain U.S. power. How much force was used and how often? This chart shows the number of times the U.S. occupied and militarily intervened in countries in the Caribbean and South America. Notice multiple occupations of Cuba, multiple occupations of the Dominican Republic and Haiti, invasions in Mexico and Nicaragua, these invasions and occupations are part of the reason why many of these Latin American nations have a long-standing dislike of the United States. Americans are seen as bullies. And here is Teddy Roosevelt with his, you can see it's big stick, enforcing order in the Caribbean, Santo Domingo, Cuba, Mexico here. Roosevelt also using force or the threat of force really to ensure that the United States would get access to Panama so that the U.S. could build the Panama Canal. When Roosevelt announced to his own cabinet what he had done in Panama, um, his Secretary of State, Elihu Root, said to him, Mr. President, you've shown that you were accused of seduction but actually prove that you are guilty of rape. Harsh words for Teddy Roosevelt's actions. Um, though Roosevelt himself didn't feel guilt, he boasted while Congress debated, I took the canal. Shown here, um, built connecting the Caribbean to the Pacific and thus increasing dramatically the possibilities for trade. We will invade for trade. More cartoons, the big stick showing up again. And then Teddy Roosevelt with a crown, the Panama Canal as his crown. That looks like a really lopsided and heavy crown. How do you hold that on your head? So, a lot of praise for Roosevelt's vigorous masculine defending of America's interests by force. But it didn't stop there. 
Roosevelt also enforced uh, the racism of the United States towards Asian migrants. You might recall back in the Gilded Age, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act to make a 10-year ban on Chinese migrants to the US because, of course, they took our jobs. A similar agreement limiting Japanese migration was negotiated in 1907. Um, at the core of this agreement was racism. Um, Japanese children growing up in San Francisco and in California were in segregated school systems and Roosevelt negotiated with uh, Japan an end to Japanese migration if the United States would work on ending discrimination against Japanese school children. And as his uh, term of office is nearing an end, Teddy Roosevelt weighed one last show of force by sending the United States Navy on a tour around the world. This is a magnificent flex known as the Great White Fleet, 1908. 45,000 mile trip so the U.S. can impress everybody around the world. Teddy Roosevelt is followed by a one-term president named William Howard Taft. Taft largely continues Teddy's policies, but historians have given Taft's policies its own name, dollar diplomacy, which could be summed up as the U.S. would use military support to make sure to protect the interests of American businessmen in the world, which is not that different from previous policies. In fact, historian William Appleman Williams has written extensively on the idea that the core of US imperialism is the extension of what businessmen want. This is Gilded Age robber barons stretching their octopus-like tentacles around the world with the help of the U.S. government. Our last uh, exploration of imperialism and its effects are through President Wilson. Wilson's policies are known as moral diplomacy. While he did protect U.S. economic interests, he framed it in a way to indicate that the U.S. was seeing its role in the world as the promoter of democracy. He once said that the U.S. would intervene to teach weaker nations how to elect good leaders. And the place where that policy gets enacted most is Mexico. Uh, Mexico goes through a revolution in 1910, which brings Francisco Madero to power. The United States is deeply interested in this revolution because oil. U.S. Um, oil companies own 90% of Mexican oil, and they are afraid. What if this revolution interferes with their control over oil? What if you know, Madero and... Um, Others end up taking control of the oil and businessmen lose their money that they've made in Mexico. So the U.S. takes the side of protecting the interests of businessmen. Things get worse in 1913 when Victoriano Huerta assassinated Madero and now, of course, there's disarray in Mexico. In comes President Wilson. Uh, Wilson calls the Mexican government a government of butchers. Obviously, they can't elect good leaders. Um, he backed um, uh, Venustio Carranza and Pancho Villa um, to help bring some order and stability to Mexico, but eventually withdraw support for Pancho Villa. And in retaliation, Villa crosses the U.S. border and murders people on a train. So the U.S. occupied the town of Veracruz and launched um, a, an invasion of Mexico in search of Pancho Villa in 1915 after he killed 18 American citizens. This is all part of Wilson's effort to teach Mexico to elect good men. That is, men 
who will respect U.S. economic interests, men who will not harm the oil production that puts money in the pockets of American robber barons. That's been our look at imperialism in the late 19th century. Next time I see you, we will be talking about uh, these three presidents again, but in the topic of progressive reform. Adios.